Welcome to the Continuum Lab. In the previous video I showed you the new capacitive keyboards that you can build using the Continuum Lab instrument kit and we went through some of the new options and functions on these instruments. But we didn't really have time to get into any of the technical aspects of how the capacitive sensors themselves work or indeed sometimes don't really work. Now I've been using the TNC microcontrollers and their capacitive sensors for years and so in this video I want to share two of the problems that I've run into and some sensible solutions to them. So let's get into it. Capacitive sensors, specifically the one cable sensors on the TNC microcontrollers, really are the main muscle which makes the click work. They are at the same time so versatile, so powerful and so simple that it's really a no-brainer. I use them for keyboard keys, string sensors, wind instrument keys, lip sensors on mouthpieces and pretty much anything that I want to activate directly with some body part. But they are not infallible. Because of the way they work, by measuring an intangible electrical field, they are very sensitive to some kinds of interference. The two main factors that must be accommodated to get a good result have to do with grounding and parasitic capacitance. The grounding issue has to do with noise being introduced normally from power lines or from a power supply because of a bad ground connection. So ideally you and the microcontroller would both be connected to the same good stable ground source. But honestly I don't normally ground myself because it's mostly impractical and just plain annoying. I find that the capacitive sensors work just fine anyway if the system has good ground and I keep an eye on not introducing noise from other sources. So what is a good ground connection anyway? Here in Spain, this is what a normal wall socket looks like. These bits here on the top and bottom are the ground connectors and a good power cable has a corresponding set on it like this one. But sometimes you have a device which doesn't have ground connectors and that's when you have to be cautious. This equipment could be compromising the functionality of your capacitive sensors. Let me show you a really bad example. And by that, of course, I mean a really good example of something going really wrong. This is a true story. I recently bought external power supplies for my two aging Canon 60Ds. Uh, when I film my build videos, these cameras are running for hours on end and uh, continuously charging the batteries was just getting really old and the batteries themselves were also getting really old and those suckers are expensive. Anyway, the thing with these fake batteries is that their power supply has no ground connector. And I don't know exactly what goes on in here, but it creates a lot of interference. So bad that if I connect the camera like this, and then plug my lapel mic into the camera and wear it like this, with this part in my pocket like I normally do, then this is what happens. With and without. even just handling this cable here. Now, the power supply is obviously not conducting electricity directly into my system, but it is interfering in the electrical field enough to mess with my sensors quite badly. So, do I know exactly how this works and where that specific signal noise is coming from? No, not really. But I did spend a lot of time troubleshooting this issue so that you don't have to, so you're welcome. If you are suddenly getting a lot of noise on otherwise perfectly good capacitive sensors, then have a look around your setup for dodgy power supplies and ungrounded electronic devices. And if you find any, then definitely do not put them in your pocket like I did. The other important factor that I want to talk about is what's called parasitic capacitance, which is just a really cool name for all of the unwanted capacitance that we end up measuring with our sensor setup. Here's an example. When we are reading any one of these keys, remember that the DIY sensor itself is really just a bit of copper tape, no different from the cable which we used to connect it. So we're in fact also measuring that cable. And it doesn't stop there, because this sensor connects through a multiplexer. So we have to also include the trace on the multiplexer, as well as the cable which connects the multiplexer to the microcontroller, as well as, check this out, the trace on the Teensy itself, which carries the signal to the chip. All of this can be considered part of the sensor, and all of it is constantly responding to changes in the electrical field, and that's what we call parasitic capacitance. It's not a separate value or a different way to read the sensor, it's simply the combined capacitive influence of everything that's connected to the sensor. 
So there are two sides to overcoming this problem. First of all, we try to make sure that the endpoint of the sensor has such a strong and clean signal that all of the parasitic capacitance read by the rest of the system can be dealt with as just a small bias and some manageable noise. Making the sensor's surface area bigger can help, but only up to a point. If you make the sensor area much larger than the finger which will be pressing on it, then you're just adding more parasitic capacitance. Having a thin dielectric layer always helps, because it makes the same equivalent sensor area much more reactive to actual touch, which diminishes the parasitic influence overall. Thin plastic of 0.5 mm thickness or less, like what you find in many food containers, works fine, and most types of adhesive tape as well. But a lot of the battle, in the case of the click instruments, can be won at the other end, not by maximizing sensor readings, but rather by minimizing parasitic capacitance. And one of the best ways of doing that is simple cable management. See, because all of these cables in here are sensing capacitance, they're actually able to sense each other, which can be a problem. If you get them tangled or scrunched up together too much, then you'll start to get a lot of crosstalk, where activating one of the sensors will also be measured on another. Allow me to demonstrate. Let's unplug these two cables, roll them up together like this, and then plug them back in. I'll upload a bit of simple code to read just these two. And now let's see what we get. Both of them are registering just fine individually, but as you can see, the one that I'm not touching also has a significant reading, which is a problem. Now, there's almost always going to be a little bit of crosstalk, especially if you have a lot of sensors and cables crammed into a small instrument. But the click code and calibration takes this into account and will work even with less than perfect cable management. This mess right here, for example, is perfectly functional. In the end, it's really all about the signal to noise ratio. So you do have some freedom to change these two different aspects to achieve the specific result that you're going for. And of course, the more care you take with these things, the higher levels of precision and sensitivity you'll be able to achieve with the capacitive sensor setup. I'm going to stop right here, but that is still not all I have to say about capacitive sensors, not by a long shot. So in the next video, we will try to stretch the click's capacitive capabilities to the maximum by using it to make a kind of midi makey makey. We should be able to make a fruit piano, no problem. And because we're using capacitive sensors, we should even be able to make it touch sensitive with a couple of caveats, which I will explain in that video. So if you're into that kind of thing, then please hit like, definitely subscribe right here on the channel. You can also check out the Continuum Lab over on Instagram, where I post news and sometimes early previews of the projects. And that's it for today, guys. Thanks for watching. Take care until next time, and I'll see you in the Continuum.